Among other appointments, he worked as a research fellow at the Social Science Research Center Berlin in the research area of technology, work, and environment during 10 years. From 2006 to 10, he was a research professor at the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes at Arizona State University. Daniel Barbin works uh, focuses on science and technology innovation and governance. His most recent book analyzes the political economy of biotechnology. In 2007, it was published with Campus under the German title Politische Ökonomie der Biotechnologie, Innovation und Gesellschaftlicher Wandel im internationalen Vergleich. Daniel Barbel will now speak on anticipatory governance of science and technology, challenges to democracy. Thank you, Regula, for the kind introduction. Um, and especially also thank to the organizers for inviting me. It's really exciting, A, to be back in Switzerland, and B, uh, also at this exciting conference. Um, before I start, uh, I would like to say as a background, which you probably won't know, is that this concept of anticipatory governance uh, is like a kind of a trademark uh, concept that the uh, institute that I was working before moving back to Europe uh, and was developed uh, at the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes and at the Center for uh, Nanotechnology in society, in especially uh, trying to develop concepts for dealing with the dynamics of new and emerging uh, technologies. At some point in my talk, I will get to that, but I just wanted to uh, say that at the beginning, and that also one of the aims of my talk is to uh, reflect on the concept and also put it in broader context and also try to develop it a little bit um, further. I think uh, Herbert's presentation provided a nice background of various examples that actually uh, could also be thought through in terms of anticipatory uh, governance. And I also think that it will touch upon some of the issues that were already raised this morning by Klaus Hoog and Hans-Peter Kriesi, although I won't be able to elaborate on them in detail because that would take uh, too much time. So after starting uh, and focusing on some of the challenges uh, uh, raised by science and technology to uh, democratic societies, I will look at capacities that are already established in different contexts of uh, modern democratic societies, and then come to talk about more recent approaches to technology assessment that try to uh, develop capacities of anticipatory uh, governance, and then come to a set of uh, conclusions and both empirical and conceptual uh, expansions of the concept. I think the main, or one of the main uh, sources uh, which make science and technology uh, a, a, a rich field of, of challenges to uh, democracy has to do with the very dynamics that new and emerging technologies often uh, seem to be uh, engendering. And so, for example, and, and then the question also, what will they bring about uh, with their very dynamics? And when we look back even like half a century ago, even those who are involved in uh, the development might, not, uh, might have difficulties in anticipating what is to come. For example, when we think of a statement made by an IBM CEO that he would think that the world market for personal computers would be about five, and therefore not really something to be uh, thinking about, then we see, okay, this kind of uh, prediction is, was completely wrong, and in our lives we couldn't uh, think about uh, our lives without uh, information and communication technologies um, anymore. And especially those uh, technologies, I think, that also Herbert was touching uh, on, that are dealing with questions of life and death, and um, significant social and cultural change, or kind of threats to already established values and norms and practices, customs, uh, uh, are often perceived as uh, challenges. Genetic engineering being a prime example. 
not least because they also touch upon the very definition of what it might mean to be human or significant issues relating to human rights, human dignity, but also privacy, uh, uh, freedom. For example, when you also think of new developments in uh, cyberspace, cybersecurity, uh, identity, theft, uh, and things like that. And so these technologies then, then and again, and in different ways in the different fields, uh, also uh, often bring up questions of, are they subject to democratic control? And more fundamentally, what at all is the role of science and technology in democratic societies? And when we look back already at the very beginning, of course, science is one of the key institutions of uh, modern democracies coming along with very uh, fundamental constitutional rights, such as uh, freedom to research, also providing a particular foundation of expertise, and science together with engineering being a key source of uh, uh, innovations that are necessary for uh, economic growth, uh, but also be part, they're also part of uh, like the dynamics of capitalist economies, which again also brings up another set of questions about uh, democratic uh, control. And as regards social change, uh, I think it's mostly perceived as a challenge um, when social change is perceived as being uh, disruptive. Another reason being that technologies also might bring about new sets of winners and losers, and the question about who actually is able uh, to make decisions about what science, what technologies to develop, and under what uh, conditions uh, to apply them. And so the concept of anticipatory governance uh, or the purpose of this uh, concept is to try and shape uh, technologies and also to shape the future significance of science and technology in societies. And this, of course, uh, it brings up the question of what are the governance capacities uh, both within and outside uh, democratic institutions? So when we speak about dynamic uh, developments in science and technology, uh, there are a number of very fundamental uh, challenges that I distinguish here in three dimensions, a temporal dimension, a material, and a social dimension. In the temporal dimension, uh, it is often uh, unclear what the time horizons will be uh, when look, I mean, uh, comparing like early stages of uh, fundamental basic research to technology development application. These time horizons can be very, very long. Uh, they can be so long that it actually never comes to fruition, or they also might be extremely short, so that new scientific insights might immediately lead to new technological interventions and applications. And the question, uh, a related question is also, what actually is the potential future significance of developments in science and technology, which is also a question that um, uh, deals with like uh, imaginations of both scientists and others about uh, what the potentials of uh, a scientific field uh, might be. In the material dimension, um, we have to distinguish between potentials of science and technology and the ways in which they are realized, which often can differ. Furthermore, that also the usefulness of science and technology depends on specific contexts in which they are applied. And just like the, the examples that uh, Herbert gave about uh, uh, human embryonic stem cell research, that means something completely different, for example, in the US or in the UK or uh, in, 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 in Italy. And so we have to take that into account. And in any case, they are both uh, intended and unintended consequences. Uh, the distinction between which uh, often might be, uh, I mean, in, uh, 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 in, uh, difficult to make, and even the intended con unintended consequences at some point might be very desirable. But it's hard, actually, but that's what I want to say, to foresee uh, the outcomes of developments in science and technology. As regards the social dimension, 
we have to take into account that there are always, or at least very often, divergent interests and preferences involved up to the point where we have really uh, antagonistic, irreconcilable uh, values, norms, preferences that in one way or another have to be dealt with. As well as in societal terms, we live in pluralistic societies, multiple institutions, organizational contexts uh, responsible for developing and applying uh, science and technology. Now, as regards the ways in which one can deal with these challenges in, in the three dimensions mentions, uh, we could say there are three basic approaches. In the temporal dimension to try and foresee uh, developments of science and technology, in the material dimension to do uh, comprehensive technology assessment, and as regards the social dimension, to try and provide uh, good ways of uh, societal participation. Limits that remain, whatever you do, is that you can't get, of, get, can't get rid of uh, the very dynamics and non-linearity of technological and social change. And also the fact that there are interdependencies between technological and social change. The very plasticity of technological applications and institutional contexts, which is a very good thing, that is that basically uh, one can always think about uh, alternatives in which technologies to develop under what conditions to apply for what purpose. And also that institutions, of course, are also uh, uh, flexible in uh, how they are set up. And a third limit, the remaining uh, divergent user preferences and concern. And in that sense, anticipation of the future is certainly necessary because it might help dealing with those uncertainties, but the uncertainties, indeterminacies, as well as ambiguities uh, remain. And also they provide a terrain uh, for uh, like democratic governance to be able to deal with. So in the next step, um, so also in order not to have anticipatory governance like as a new fancy approach uh, that is completely uh, separated from our established institutions, I would like to go through quickly uh, some of the main institutions that um, shape uh, the development of science and technology in society and that are concerned with various aspects of their generation, regulation and enculturation. So, first of all, innovation uh, is a prime context because science and technology, uh, to a large extent, are supposed to contribute to uh, economic or societal innovation. And here we see that various uh, institutions, actors uh, in government, industry, think tanks or academia, um, are pursuing different kinds of approaches to foresight, for example, by uh, monitoring, road mapping, uh, scenario exercises, and the like. Another key institution, also key for democratic societies, is uh, the domain of risk management. Because, uh, not least of all, in, in uh, modern uh, societies, the uh, imperative to innovate is usually also balanced by precautions to take care of potential health and environmental uh, risks. And so in different countries and different places and institutions we have uh, rather elaborate frameworks uh, that are supposed or, or work on behalf of prevention or precaution uh, as regulatory principles. And uh, in, in, in action that can mean uh, moratoria or also international uh, agreements, for example, with regard to uh, biosafety, uh, cross border movement, uh, uh, in, etc. Another key institution is uh, intellectual property rights, uh, previously called industrial property rights, now called intellectual property rights, not least because of the immense. Uh, knowledge basis of uh, contemporary uh, innovation. 
And here, uh, institutions uh, are supposed to uh, provide both rewards for private innovators while at the same time balancing and securing the innovativeness of society. So you have to balance like private and public interest and the patent system is doing this uh, uh, yeah, in, in quite successful ways, but in ways that at some point also um, uh, create conflicts. Uh, again, information technology, biotechnology are important uh, uh, examples, but nevertheless, uh, with regard to innovativeness, there are built-in uh, capacities to uh, try to govern science and technology in a way that they remain key sources of innovation in modern society. Further, ethics. Uh, we've had it uh, several times uh, today. Basically here, uh, the problem is about uh, what are the relevant norms or what norms could we get to and should implement in order to guide uh, decision making and what kind of sanctions, uh, especially uh, in cases that regard uh, morally sensitive or dubious options of uh, action. And at our disposal or at the disposal of uh, the institutions concerned, and these can be legal institutions, but these can also be hospitals or professional organizations uh, of doctors uh, or researchers, uh, for example, are laws, uh, guidelines, or an even weaker form, uh, declarations. And I think it's an example that hasn't been mentioned uh, so far, but that the German embryo protection law, in my view, is a very interesting and also impressive example of uh, trying to uh, govern reproductive technologies in a anticipatory way. Because the law was decided upon and implemented in 1990 at a time when many of the technologies that were discussed there were not at hand. And the idea, and I think it was a wise idea of the uh, policymaker was to try and set up a regulatory framework, valid advance uh, before the technologies uh, would become available and then you might have much I mean, stronger pressure by uh, uh, interest groups, uh, lobby groups, uh, but also the actors involved in actually uh, wanting to develop and apply uh, those. And uh, unlike the British uh, framework, it's very uh, restrictive. Uh, all it didn't do was foresee a legal gap, uh, which is not surprising because at the time uh, human uh, stem cells were not, uh, embryonic stem cells were not known or the ability to cultivate and create uh, them. And so the issue of importing them into Germany uh, later came up as a like, key policy debate. But compared to other places, as a very limited uh, uh, topic because it was clear as regards the law, uh, creating uh, embryonic stem cells was not allowed, but the question of the import uh, remained open. And finally, uh, another context which I call acceptance politics um, deals with the shaping of the, uh, the, the public perceptions and the acceptance of uh, science and technology. And what is at stake is basically how do people perceive uh, future uh, science and technology? Uh, do they appreciate them? Uh, are they ignorant? Do they uh, resist them? So we see uh, that in uh, ways characterized by these institutional domains, there are uh, certain capacities that we could describe in terms of anticipatory governance. But because they are related to specific contexts, they are also maybe limited uh, through those specific contexts. And if you have a maybe more uh, challenging idea of how to govern, uh, then we might have to go one step further in asking how actually uh, should one do in a smart way reforms uh, with regard to each of these uh, contexts um, mentioned here. 
So in the next step, I would like to talk uh, in uh, some detail about technology assessment and anticipatory governance. As you may know, uh, multiple approaches to technology assessment have been developed uh, since the 1960s and also in a variety of institutional uh, domain. For example, uh, and this I think was I mean, one of the prime areas, technology assessment as an advisory institution to uh, parliaments, but it was also conducted in the context of uh, companies when developing uh, new products or uh, thinking about entering a new area of research and development, as well as also in academia and public uh, research. And early on, technology assessment was often conceptualized or articulated as early warning systems, which also uh, expresses that uh, or, or shows the relation to uh, the idea of anticipatory uh, governance. Core ideas of technology uh, assessment are, and this again relates to the three dimensions that I introduced earlier, is that TA should be conducted as early as possible, because if you do it too late, you might have a hard time or not be able at all, or only at a very high cost, uh, able to shape uh, science and technology anymore, so as early as possible. Furthermore, it should be closely related to research and development in order to have an effect, because otherwise it's an exercise of thinking about potential implications that might not matter as long as uh, those uh, doing science, those doing engineering and technology development are not part of it. And furthermore, um, technology assessment should also provide multiple perspectives, starting with multiple uh, perspectives as uh, provided by scientific, scientific and engineering disciplines, but also perspectives as um, um, represented by different actors and uh, stakeholders because those are the ones that uh, are essentially shaping the public debate and also possibly political actions around new science and technology. So about 10 years ago, um, there has always been a complaint that technology assessment would still come too late, not be closely related to science and technology uh, enough. And so with the uh, uh, new forms of technology assessment were introduced. And I think the, maybe the first and very remarkable one, which also led to a new set of broad institutionalization of technology assessment uh, in the research domain uh, related to the uh, human genome project and the field of genomics. It started in the United States in 1990 uh, at the proposition of uh, Jim Watson uh, that about, I think it was 5% of the research, research budget should be spent on research on ethical, legal and social issues, uh, which in Europe then was uh, institutionalized in the form of ethical, legal and social aspects. So Elsie Elsa research since then uh, is well established and has become part of the research enterprise uh, in one way or another. And again, a uh, newer case, uh, the field of nanotechnology. And here especially, and maybe surprisingly, that uh, under a very conservative uh, government, the one of George Bush II, at the nanotechnology initiative in the early 2000s, um, um, uh, and the Nanotechnology uh, Research and Development Act uh, basically uh, said that research should be conducted on the social implications of nanotechnology and that the National Science Foundation should have a comp competition and establish centers that are dealing uh, with that. So uh, social implications should be really taken seriously and it was implemented in politics. So we have a broad set of research on ethical, legal, and social issues, as mentioned, and uh, a variety of interesting, uh, slightly or more strongly, I mean, different approaches to uh, what in one case is called uh, constructive technology assessment, 
which actually predates the genomic or nanotech uh, debate, but has had an upswing again since, which was developed uh, uh, mostly in the Netherlands, in the US, and that's the center I was working at. Uh, it was called real-time technology assessment, that is, that it tried to do technology assessment as the research occurs. And uh, mostly in the UK, uh, uh, a pretty significant body of research and also experimentation with public engagement that is called uh, upstream engagement. So just briefly, and maybe now a bit uh, more quickly, um, uh, mention a couple of elements of uh, RTTA as developed at uh, Arizona State. So as I already indicated, um, the center was basically, um, f f is, is or has been funded, I mean, it's now, I think it is sixth or seventh uh, year, by f quite generous, uh, especially for social sciences, funds by the National uh, Science Foundation. It's based on a political mandate, the 21st Century Nanotechnology R&D Act of 2003. It operates as an inter-university network and is organized in uh, various uh, uh, research uh, and thematic research areas. Now, key elements, and I can only uh, mention this very briefly, of the concept of anticipatory governance as we've developed it are, uh, or relate to uh, the idea of foresight. And so we've developed different measures of actually trying to generate anticipatory knowledge. Second, integration of different kinds of knowledge uh, as it is significant uh, in uh, different academic cultures, especially knowledge uh, from science and engineering on the one hand and humanities and social sciences uh, on the other hand. And thirdly, um, uh, engagement, that is uh, uh, participatory exercises to provide inputs by publics and citizens and one, I mean, maybe small, innovative step that was pursued here is in light of the fact that the U.S. is so huge um, and basically face-to-face -face meetings uh, have only always take to, to take place, uh, I mean, locally, but that also the, the localities are, can be vastly uh, different, for example, whether you do uh, such an exercise in uh, the Midwest or the East Coast or California or the South. Um, so it was done face-to-face -face in different localities, but also online. And I think as we, uh, this is an element of medialization that uh, might help also expand these exercises beyond uh, local experiences. And furthermore, uh, what's characteristic of the uh, mode of in which the center operates is that, uh, and I think that's something I really want to stress, uh, is that scientists and, and engineers have a key role, for example, in the ways in which they collaborate in the center with uh, humanists and social scientists, uh, both at the level of research or teaching, that also provide uh, advice and consult on certain uh, issues where it is necessary to have input by scientific experts, for example, when it is about thinking about future uh, potentials of uh, nanotechnology, but uh, also quite importantly, um, that they also are willing to serve as research subjects. That is, that they are basically providing their time to talk about um, basically, I mean, what kind of decisions they make in their research how they think about uh, potential impacts of, of nanotech and the very stuff that they're doing research and technology development on, or might also be engaged with uh, commercial enterprises, which is more uh, common or much more common uh, in the US uh, than at least in some uh, European countries. So uh, what can be achieved at least conceptually, or to some extent, of course, I mean, it has to be also uh, empirically, through anticipatory governance of this kind, of the kind that I just presented, is that it might uh, contribute 
to a, to a at least partial reconfiguration of the social relationships in academic research and development, as well as between the technology development and society more broadly. So now to come to the conclusion, when we look about the dynamics of science and technology and the futures of science and technology, uh, of course we are always at a certain point in the present and I think it's important to learn uh, from uh, the past. But when we think uh, about the future, then we have on the one hand a, a, a massive range of uh, possible futures. But only some of them we are able to forecast and an even smaller uh, amount of them uh, will be considered desirable. While at the same time, what some people consider a desirable future might be considered uh, undesirable uh, by others. And then also another determinant that we have to take uh, into account is the questions of uh, feasibility. So what actually are uh, uh, things that science and technology will be able to achieve? What are realistic assumptions? What are theoretical possibilities? What is hypothetically possible, what might be pure uh, science fiction, but science fiction done in a more uh, bad sense and not the imaginative that um, opens up your mind uh, uh, into thinking of what still might uh, come. So as regards the challenges to technology assessment in the way I've presented it here is, uh, for example, when we look at uh, those experiments going on at Arizona State, with regard to the whole nanotech uh, uh, research and development landscape, uh, this is of course only a drop uh, on a hot stone. I mean, it's, it's, uh, if it should work in practice at some point, it would be necessary to further institutionalize uh, this, this or uh, such kinds of uh, integrated technology assessment, which would require um, political will, appropriate funding, and also the implementation not only in public, uh, but also in private settings. And uh, 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 it would uh, require, but also enable, I think, uh, learning by all participants involved. But learning, as nice as it sounds, it can be a hard thing uh, 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 at times. Opportunities um, that anticipatory governance in the way presented uh, may bring up are uh, improved technologies, both in the sense of how technologies are developed and the outcomes the technologies will uh, create when implemented and applied uh, in society. And another opportunity, I think, is that, it, that, that anticipatory governance uh, in the sense of an integrated uh, and also publicly engaged research enterprise uh, might also contribute to improved uh, societal uh, embedding. Uh, and also uh, with regard to uh, the conditions of application, user preferences that are taken into account early in the stage of development and not only as an add-on later after maybe many and hard years of conflict. So the limits that remain, especially uh, with regard to uh, the ASU uh, example uh, that I gave is, um, what about the capacities to, to shape later sta stages of technology developments? So far, it has been applied in the context of pretty much of basic uh, research, but what about shaping the later stages? Secondly, we, have to, we would have to think about uh, strengthening anticipatory ca uh, capacities in regulatory uh, settings, um, be it patenting, maybe risk management, uh, probably ethics. And what is also lacking is or at least hasn't been developed yet, are feedback me mechanisms to institutions of democratic as well as, uh, as corporate uh, decision making. And I think this would be uh, like a strategic uh, 
important, uh, next important strategic step and something to really think deeply about it. So, my final slide. Um, I think when talking about anticipatory governance and when thinking that this might be a useful way of approaching the dynamics of science and technology, but potentially also other issues of great future importance in society, what is required to go beyond uh, what has already been achieved is, for example, uh, or not least, institutional change. So you'd have to think about uh, institutional change in this sense at the local, national and international uh, levels. Anticipatory governance, secondly, mostly stresses a temporal aspect of the now and the future. But at the same time, I think, uh, at least theoretically, conceptually, it would also be worthwhile, but this would be a different uh, presentation, to think about its connection to what uh, one might call reflexis, re reflexive governance. That is, the uh, when thinking, uh, looking at the structures and practices uh, and the very co social and material condition that um, uh, underlie certain institutional and organizational uh, contexts as well as everyday life uh, practices. My examples so far were related to new and emerging technologies, but of course also infrastructures also uh, bring about immense, massive challenges for future-oriented transformation and thus anticipatory governance. Um, examples that all of you know relate to energy, sustainable building, city development, um, spatial development, mobility, water and waste. Uh, and often these fields that are already quite complicated and one complication of dealing with them is that they are infrastructures, that is, they are already established. Huge investments have been uh, shaped. They are part of everyday life of how uh, the world works. And so transforming them is uh, a challenge uh, of a different kind than technologies that are not here yet, such as rich uh, uh, um, uh, nanotechnological uh, applications. And another area that I've started thinking about and also doing researching about, which is at an even, uh, is certainly at a, also a very challenging one, but is at an even different level to the, to the, to the uh, infrastructures, uh, relates to geoengineering, which on the one hand we could understand as an emerging science and technology. Geoengineering meaning uh, the, uh, or referring to the idea that global problems, in particular climate change, could be dealt with uh, science and technology that are uh, developed uh, at the, and, and implemented, applied at the global scale. For example, uh, by um, uh, I mean, there are two main approaches. One is called carbon dioxide removal and the other one is called solar radiation management. And so one example of uh, applications uh, is that one might try to uh, simulate something like a permanent volcanic eruption. Uh, because one knows that a huge volcano that is like darkening the skies uh, for a large area for a long time uh, actually decreases uh, the temperature of, uh, around the globe for a year or two. And so uh, why not uh, uh, pump uh, small particles uh, up into the atmosphere to try to prevent uh, the sun from coming down to Earth? Uh, and this is just one example, but it makes clear that, uh, for example, I mean, what Hans-Peter Kriersi has mentioned uh, this morning, that the gap between the decision makers and the decision takers, those concerned, uh, is very likely to be uh, divergent. And, and that even if a country should have the capacity to do this uh, technology, uh, I mean, to, to implement uh, such experiments or actually deploy them, 
that in other uh, corners of the world uh, people might be affected because the re regional distribution of such experiments uh, might be uh, uh, very different in different places, but at the same time probably also very uh, um, predictable. And so, as regards this newer field of research and development, I think that it broadly lacks um, capacities of democratic uh, governance and of global legitimacy. Which, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lack, it's a challenge, but it has to be dealt with. And finally, uh, and now I'm speaking a bit as an like old and having lived for many years uh, abroad, uh, now also patriotic uh, Swiss, is that I think that the future-oriented adaptation of uh, democratic institutions also might include uh, thinking about how to strengthen elements of direct democracy at levels other than the local or national that allow for it, uh, but also European or supranational global uh, levels. But how to do that, with what forms of representation, uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, that would be another debate, but I think uh, it might be uh, an important and worthwhile one. Thank you. Daniel Barbon for this rich talk and the floor is open for discussion. Yes, please. I would like to touch two issues which you didn't stress in your talk. The first one is you, you mentioned uh, development, innovation, applications, but you did not mention creativity. And my question is democracy a break for creativity? under the way we see it today. I take the example, there are many frameworks, projects or program, and, and many researchers are doing very interesting observation, but they cannot pursue and follow this observation because the institution does not allow this type of research in, in a new field. And, and this is, in fact, uh, a type of, of break for, for the progress of, of, of science. So what do you think uh, about that? And the second issue is the one of patenting, which is not at the beginning of, of the creativity and so on, but later, as you mentioned. Four years ago, the uh, uh, Swiss uh, government decided to revise the patent law. And at the time, it was impossible to make the patent lawyers aware of the emerging importance of epigenetic. And, and we had endless discussion. It was impossible. So the issue there is the, the law or the, or the government or the democracy steps are always behind the progress of science. And the time of adaptation is a real, uh, very important issue. Could you comment on those two points, please? Um, <clears throat> um, I hope so. Um, I don't know whether I, I exactly understood precisely the, the first point about creativity. Um, whether you implied that creativity by scientists uh, uh, creativity needs a certain freedom in science. Absolutely. And if you have a framework program which is tight, as it is the tendency today due to the democratic uh, type of mm -hmm. pressure, then you don't, many researchers do not have this freedom in, 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 in research anymore. Um, well, I mean, generally I still... One, one can still say that uh, I mean, freedom of research is a well-acknowledged and well-established uh, institution. But by having like programmed uh, research funding, maybe some of the uh, liberties to freely tinker around uh, might be endangered. Uh, and so this would mean that uh, what one needs is at least a balance of enough space for 
uh, free, undirected research that still can bring about uh, unforeseen insights and, I mean, alternate insights that have to come about after five years because the program is five years, so that you at least have a balance between, like, programmed and, and uh, free research. Uh, this might be a solution to just say we provide the institutional diversity to have like the more old style type of basic research and the m more new recent one that uh, tries to combine uh, certain outcomes and benefits to uh, the research investment. Um, as regards the, I mean, patent law is really a very, very tricky uh, thing. And often I think also all this, I mean, litigation show I mean, that the institutional flexibility and the further development of the whole institution is, is too slow and maybe too murky and too much also subject to legal litigation and, and, and law cases. And uh, both at the, like, at, at the regional level, be it Europe or the US, but also uh, at the transnational level where you've had uh, long controversies uh, between, for example, the European Patent Office and the US Patent Office as regards the uh, criteria for granting uh, patents in the life sciences. And so I think the future of the patent system, I mean, provides several options. I mean, one would be to basically keep it as it is with certain modifications. Another one might also be to think about uh, getting rid of it and come to, uh, I mean, more open source type of uh, uh, developments and uh, but this is not a I mean, broad field of debate about uh, to what extent are intellectual property rights still uh, useful in uh, uh, these days uh, with regard to the uh, intention uh, uh, why they were established in the first place. That is to uh, basically uh, create and foster innovativeness. But I think one also has to discuss it with regard to certain uh, areas. And it might be very different, like in mechanical engineering to in, uh, information technology, uh, to bio, uh, or to also other kinds of... Uh, and still the question remains, who is going to benefit? And then also these more recent debates about how to uh, share the benefits. And maybe also the north-south distribution questions, I think, still remain... Uh, Important. Interesting talk. Um, I have a question um, about uncertainty. Uh, anticipatory governance uh, seems to be an attempt to reduce uncertainty uh, with respect to future developments. But there is this interesting paradox, which we know from science studies, that the more uh, one tries to reduce uncertainty, the more it grows. So, so. How, and at the same time, um, um, the question might be there, uh, how could we sort of build in the fact that there is uncertainty with respect to many things which are in the future into this notion of anticipatory governance? Um, I think the, the, the notion of uncertainty is, is, is a key one. Uh, but it, I think it's already an important step to talk about what kinds of uncertainty are there involved and about how do we try to deal with them, and which ones are the more complicated ones or the more significant ones uh, for uh, decision making. And so just to try to, to map and sort out the field, uh, because it doesn't help if you don't uh, think about uncertainties or if you have naive assumptions about uh, controllability and basically certainties that you can uh, uh, create for your own benefit. I have a question about the relationship between governance and government. I mean, uh, th there is a romance of uh, direct democracy creeping up in this session, even in the session before. Uh, the relation would probably be that the anticipatory governance is about initiating debates uh, uh, making awareness of problems and perhaps in some cases uh, uh, adding to the agenda setting both of corporate decision making or of democratic decision making. In the end, 
I mean, there is no reason why you should trust direct governance more than representative governance because the dynamics of technology will always be outside the government. And that's, that's the real problem. It's about social evolution. And as you cannot control, let's say, the development of the family and partnership uh, constellations or fertility or maybe even migration, uh, you cannot control the rise of new technology. And that means that the new technology will always fit in with very powerful and even legitimate interests in the society, though in the end it's all about a little bit more reflexivity, a little bit more precaution, and information about whether this is useful. It is not part of the governments, at least not in liberal democracy, to decide whether something is useful and should therefore be allowed or is not useful and should therefore be banned. Um, yeah, I think it's an important question, especially in the context of a debate about uh, challenging uh, democracy. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily see it as, a, as an opposite government and governance, because I think, I mean, these days one has to take into account uh, both. Uh, and maybe I'd be wrong, but I've understood the, uh, like the impetus of the governance debate to say, okay, uh, important decisions that relate to uh, the public good or that shape uh, social affairs are taken beyond the realm of uh, public institutions and beyond uh, the government. And so we have like a distribution of like governmental capacities. And also corporations might be places of agenda setting, of, of actually policy making. And that depending on the field we have to look at what, in what ways these uh, competencies are distributed and organized and what role the government still has in these uh, government, governance uh, arrangements. And so I think, uh, I mean, I would agree that this anticipatory governance certainly might contribute to a debate, agenda setting, uh, a generation of, of uh, uh, information and reflexivity. But also the government uh, is also, I think, a better government if it tries to govern in an anticipatory way that goes beyond uh, the election cycle of four or five years. For example, that, I mean, I think that, that the, probably the, the, poli the policies that will be most appreciated are also po politicians who had the courage to say, okay, what are the major challenges we are dealing with? I mean, that's like environmental change, uh, energy problem, climate change, demographic change, uh, and, and, and those problems you can't really deal with in a, in a, in a four or five uh, year framework because that might lead you to just uh, uh, ignore it, put it on the carpet, say, okay, if I'm re-elected, that's fine, but it's not fine as regards uh, the public good. And so I think uh, also government, uh, I mean, should be uh, put under this kind of pressure. And the debate that I've, uh, I mean, observed a little with regard to, um, I mean, for example, Wolf's uh, presidential address uh, about the significance of Muslims in German society, I think was also one about like the significance of uh, demographic change and to the extent to which uh, institutions of uh, uh, German public and private life, including government, are really f up to the challenge. And so in that sense, I would look at, I mean, try to see, I mean, uh, what can each uh, institution uh, contribute to uh, better solving uh, existing problems. Yes, in Jacques Dubochet, Lausanne, in biological research, in, in medical research, it is the law that every experiment is controlled, is tested, is, is goes through a procedure of acceptance or not through an ethic committee. Uh, it is not the case, of course, for other biological or physical research. And... Uh, but nevertheless, it goes 
for the interest of the society. And we have famous example as, for example, the synthesis of the, uh, of the poliovirus from the sequence, which is a very nice achievement uh, technically, but of course it's, it's, it's a qu very questionable experiment at the time where the total eradication of, of uh, poliomyelite is, is tried. Uh, and so I'm wondering if there is not some, something to think. I think it's going in new direction, but a long way further on, on some kind of direction of some kind of ethical, of social ethical committee around the direction of research. Yes. <laughs> Not so easy to accept. <laughs> Maybe we can continue offline later in a break or at dinner. Thank you.